and only in this situation. So there were about 700 sessions going back and forth, and that's when you would see the deadlock. But we had no way of creating so many sessions, and we had no idea how that this is what caused it. When we finally saw this graph, we knew what was going on, and we solved it in two hours. So deadlocks are really nasty things. And the only thing you have against them is your logic when you write the application. So coming back to this is, how would you know you have a deadlock? And the answer is, you know, you need to, to figure this out at a level that has enough of a perspective on the system. In other words, in the operating system, or in our case, in that applica web application container that saw everything that happened in those applications. So this place that has visibility on everything that's going on may create a graph of processes. And when I say processes, this can be threads. So you think of processes as execution units, not necessarily processes in programs being run, but rather execution units. So it has a graph of processes and resources. Now, when I say resource, uh, well, I'll get back to this. So you have processes and resources. So if we have here six processes and eight resources, and the, the, the arrows are of two types. Solid ones mean that the process locked the resource. So P0 successfully locked already R0 and R7. P1 locked R1 and P2 locked R2. Okay, and here is the parentheses. <clears throat> when you, when I say lock a resource, it may be a little confusing. There is a little thing going on there because the resource is actually maybe an integer or a float, right? Or maybe a region, a larger region of memory. Resources are not always th things that you lock directly, but you always lock something associated with them, right? You protect them with an associated mutex. So when I say lock a resource, I mean either lock the resource directly, a file can be locked directly, or lock the associated synchronization mechanism. So now coming back at this, solid arrows mean lock a resource, dashed arrow means I want to lock the resource. So if you keep this graph, it's kind of easy to see deadlocks. And I'm, since you've read the material, or hopefully you did, uh, you'll notice that deadlocks are actually uh, cycles in this graph. So if you keep this graph updated and you search for cycles, you are going to find deadlocks. Here you have a deadlock, deadlock between P1 and P2 and another one between P3, P4, and P5. Right? This is a larger group of processes waiting for each other. Now let's see some questions here. <clears throat> so Berzent, yes, some kind of process that knows who holds what mutex, that would be the operating system or some kind of higher level entity. Uh, the microphone is scratchy, sorry about that. Hopefully it's not very bad. Keeping logs is mandatory on a large scale, yes. Um, production systems need to have logs. You need to have insight in what's going on. You may read about matrix and log uh, management. There are tools to do that. Uh, for small things, it's not so bad. But when you have a large, a large scale application, and it just doesn't work, you have no idea what's going on unless you have some kind of logs telling you what's there. So that's how you figure out you have a deadlock. You just look in the graph allocation, source, sorry, resource allocation graph and figure out if there are cycles. You just run a graph algorithm, figure out the cycles. Those are the deadlocks. All right. And finally, <clears throat> how do you prevent a deadlock? What can you do so that a deadlock doesn't happen? And you know the answer for this as well. Choose an order in which you log the resources and use it the same everywhere. Doesn't matter which order, just make sure it's the same everywhere. That's the 
solution. Now, let's have a look at why this is. So, <clears throat> in order for a deadlock to happen, there is a number of conditions that must take place. It's it's a they, they are necessary and sufficient. Okay, if one of them is missing, you cannot have a deadlock. And you don't need more than this to have a deadlock. So these four conditions are listed here. And one is mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion means that you can have a process having exclusive access to a resource, meaning you provide uh, <coughs> means to lock a resource. Without this, you wouldn't have a deadlock and nobody would lock anything. However, we need those. Without locks, we would get corrupted results. So this is a condition that is natural to keep. We cannot destroy it. The idea is that if out of these four conditions, we can make one not happen, we'll not have a deadlock. But the first one, we cannot undo. We need it. We need to be able to lock resources. Second one is lock and wait, which means I allow processes to lock a resource and while holding it, try to lock another one, which implies waiting, right? If you lock a mutex, when you try to lock the second one, if it's not available, you'll wait. So this is again something that is kind of natural to use in programming. It's easy to think like that. You could try to come up with a way of programming that says, if I lock a resource or any number of resources, and then I have to wait for one to lock, I will just release everything and start again. If you do that, you're not going to have a deadlock, but it's going to be a really weird way of programming. So I would say lock and wait is something that makes uh, the logic of the programs easier to understand. So we are not going to undo this either. The third one is about non-preemption. And this is, again, natural. This says, if I'm holding on to a lock, I need to rely on the fact that nobody's going to take it away from me. So, because if it can take it away from me, then it's not going to be a deadlock. The second one who wants to lock the mutex will just take it, even if, if I have it. So, it kind of defeats the purpose of a mutex. So, not stealing locks is natural to have. And the first condition, and this is the one that we will attack, is avoid circular weight. Try to prevent forming a circle of processes waiting for each other. And this one you break by simply locking resources in order. You do that, you cannot create a circle, and you're not going to have that a deadlock. Let me see what you guys been talking about. <clears throat> okay. Now, 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 all right, so nothing to answer to. So let me give you an example here. The so-called so philosopher's problem. It's, it's a well-known example. Uh, if I were to teach this at the whiteboard, I would actually show them with chopsticks, so they would be Chinese, and it would make a little more sense maybe. But here is knife and fork. It's going to be good enough as well. So we have eight philosophers who need to eat. And in order to eat, they need uh, two utensils. But there is a sh shortage of silverware. So they only have eight, I mean, four forks and four knives, and that's it. And then in order to eat, they need one of each. So they sit down. And then they reach for, for the fork and the knife, right? Now, if they all reach with their right hand first and pick up a utensil, they will be deadlocked. None of them would have access to the second one, second utensil, so that they can start eating. And that's a deadlock. Right? The same thing would happen if they all pick up with their left hand. <clears throat> uh, 
You did it already. Great. Well, I guess not everybody, so I'll, I'll go through it now. And uh, if you enforce here locking resources in order, you really won't have a deadlock because of that. So if we give an order to these utensils, we number them from 1 to 8. And we impose an or a rule such as always pick up first the tool with the smaller index or with the larger index. Doesn't doesn't really matter. For now, let's go with the smaller index. So if we impose this rule, always pick up the tool with the smaller index first, then when they all reach with the right hand, B would pick up the knife which has a smaller index than the fork. So B will pick it up. C will pick up the fork because it has a smaller index than the knife. D will do the same. They will go round and round. H will pick up the knife because it has a smaller index than the fork. But then A will not pick up the fork. A will try to pick up the knife. So although A reaches with the right hand, he's not really allowed to reach with the right hand. So he'll go for the knife, but the knife is taken by B, so A will just wait, and the fork will stay on the table, which means H, after it picked up the knife, can pick up the fork. It eats, puts the, the tools back, washes them, I guess, right? No virus exchanging going on here. And then G can pick up the knife and the fork. Eat, put them down. F can do the same, and there is no deadlock. Eventually, when B is done eating, A can pick up the knife, which has index 1, and the 4, which is index 8, and eats. So, simply imposing an order on, on resource locking avoids the deadlock. Let's see what, what you guys are talking about here. Yeah, we kill philosophers with knives, that's fine. Why not? Under these circumstances, though. Thank you, William Aki. That, that's really that's a really good analogy. <laughs> you guys are funny. You you really are. Okay, so nothing for me to answer to just stuff to read and enjoy. All right, so please remember this. Watch out for the order in which you log resources. Is the dead giveaway that you have uh, you have uh, potential potential deadlock risks there. I will also want you to read the banker's algorithm. It's it's a it's a more complex solution and uh, way of doing things, and get used to it. I mean, not get used. Sorry, get familiar with it. And I will switch now to the last part of today's uh, lecture. We will go to scheduling. <sighs> There's a lot of scrolling to be done here. I just want to talk a little bit about scheduling. I'll leave a part of it for, for next time. But let's put ourselves in the shoes of somebody who wants to write an operating system. So when you want to write an operating system, you will need to address certain problems that will come up as soon as you start uh, working with it, right? You, you get it started. So one of the, the questions that you need to address is, all right, I have my operating system. And then there are programs that need to be run. What program will I run when? How do I choose what to run? And if we are to start with one of those systems that just accept jobs, Right, to give, they, they accept jobs, they run them, they give back results. The question is, how, how should I choose what runs when? <clears throat> uh, yeah, close here, uh, there is. But it's, I'm, it's not that pick lowest index utensil never locks. It could be pick higher utensil as well. There is proof, this is the way the simplest way to avoid deadlocks. So coming back to the jobs, uh, a simple way of choosing what to run when is the natural one. 
first come, first serve. Whichever job arrives first gets executed. And when it's done, you take the next and take the next. So this would be a simple enough solution. However, <clears throat> you've all been waiting in lines at stores at the point, and probably you, you were in the situation of just wanted to buy a bottle of milk, and then you had somebody with really two big carts in front of you. In this case, your delay would be really large because the other guy had a lot to do, right? But if you sneaked in front, his delay would be really small because you only take a very short amount of time to finish whatever you need, right? Buy a bottle of milk. So this is something that you can consider. If I could get some estimates on how large the jobs will be when they come to the system, I could schedule the shortest job first. So that would be another approach. Choose the shorter jobs first in an attempt to minimize the overall relays. Obviously, this uh, may result in frustration for the larger jobs who would be starving because shorter jobs would keep sneaking in front of them. So you have to come up with, up with a way of making this fair. But shorter jobs first is another simple way of choosing what to execute, provided provided that you have a way of telling how long the jobs will take. Then uh, <clears throat> you may have priorities assigned to your to your tasks. Based on what? This is really up to you. You either may know that this is a very important job, so I have to do it now. Or maybe the client who gives you the job pays more, so then, yeah, you're going to push, push it to the front of the queue. The idea is that you can assign priorities to your jobs, and then they will be executed according to their priority. Higher priority gets executed earlier. I'm going to skip deadline scheduling. I'll leave it for next time. So I'll just switch to round robin. This is what happens today, mostly. But it's much more involved than that. You have a lot of jobs. And you want them to progress simultaneously in a way. Because you have an interactive system, people expect everything on the screen to move, right? So then what you do is you use time sharing in a round robin fashion. You take the first job and you give it a quanta of time. To execute. When that quantum of time is done, you take it off the CPU and you give a quanta to the next job. And when that's done, you give a quanta to the next job and you keep going round and round, giving to each job quantas of times until they are done. And then they progress simultaneously. Now you can combine this with priorities. You can come up with a solution like this. Jobs with a higher priority get more processor. So if I have a higher priority, maybe I get two quantas of time or three quantas of time. And the algorithms get pretty complex from, from this point on. So I'm not going to go much into them. If maybe if I have time, I'll, I'll try to, to offer something like that in the last lecture. Uh, <clears throat> but I want to just point to you. Uh, a story from 1997 about a, a robot deployed on Mars, which kept resetting itself due to, whoops, hold on, what the heck is going on here? Due to uh, a mix of threat priority and synchronizations, in this case, mutex. So when you put together concurrency with priorities and with mutexes, you may end up with really funny behaviors. So <clears throat> this is the story that I'm talking about. You can search for it on Google. It's really easy to find. Maybe it's e easier to look for Mars robot mutex and you'll find it. Please read the story. 
and try to understand what happened. It's also really cool how they fixed it from Earth. Oh, you want a, sto a storytelling hour? <laughs> if I'm done with the material, why not? Absolutely. I'll start with Hansel and Gretel, and then I'll choose some other spooky Brothers Grimm story. All right. So <clears throat> this will actually be quite educational. So go through it and figure out what happens if you have threads of different priorities waiting on mutexes for each other. It will teach you a lot. So with this, I would like to stop today's lecture. Next time, we'll talk a little bit about the, the deadline scheduling, and then we'll move to memory management, we'll, which will be massive and might stretch into the other week as well. <clears throat> if there are questions, I'm going to wait a minute to see what you guys need. If not, I'll stop. Can I paste the link? Yeah, I think I can. Here you go. Oh, there's anti now. I know. I, I want to see them as well. I want to see statistics, I want to see how you guys work, but I'm only one person and there is so much to do. Maybe this weekend, although this, this weekend I have to get the lecture notes up, updated. I'll see how my inspiration goes, but you'll know you're great. Don't worry about it. All right, so I guess, I guess uh, that's it for today. Enjoy the rest of the day. Some of you and some of the guys in the Romanian section, we have a meeting right now about the exams. You should have received from them the Jitsi link on which we meet. Uh, so I'll see you in a few minutes. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Buddy. Bye-bye.